it's not just going to come to you magically. You have to put yourself in a slightly precarious situation where you're able to receive that kindness and generosity and hospitality and warmth. And unless you put yourself in the position, it's not going to come to you because how could it? Welcome to the Crossing It Off podcast, where we believe living with intention through a bucket list lifestyle is a great way to bring yourself personal joy. As you are crossing items off your list, you're actually filling up your bucket. The more items you cross off, the more joy gets added, until eventually your joy spills over into the lives of those around you. Now let's start crossing it off together. Is one of the intentions that you have for your bucket list to expand your bubble, to get yourself out of your comfort zone? Well, today's bucket list storyteller is going to do that for you. If not a lot, at least just a little bit, because he's put himself out there in the world in a pretty unique way. Let's learn how he does that and start crossing it off. My guest today is Paul McDougall, and Paul describes himself as a travel writer, a digital nomad, and a lover of laughter. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. How are you? I'm good. So tell our listeners, what is it that you crossed off your list? The thing on the list was go hitchhiking. Okay. So this was probably, a, you know, before you can order a car, this was probably something that people did a lot, you know, with Lyft and Uber, probably not so much anymore that you could have access to a ride. So what was it about hitchhiking that kind of drew you to say, hey, I want to go, I want to go attempt this. I want to do this intentionally. So it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't really the need for a ride that made me do it. Although obviously it was that as well, because when you hitchhike, you get in a car. But um, I've been traveling for a long time. Uh, I've been traveling for probably about 10 years, more or less. Um, And I'm always just looking for ways to sort of up the ante, if you know what I mean, and to take things a little bit further. But the the, the three main, because I was trying to think, to prepare for this, I was trying to think, why did I want to hitchhike? And I think it falls into sort of three separate categories, the reasons that I wanted to do it. And the first one is unpredictability. So I, I know that it's not for everybody, but when I travel, I not so much these days because I, I work online as well. But back in the day when I used to travel more freely, one of my favorite things about travel was unpredictability mm-hmm. and not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing where I'm going to sleep that night, not knowing where I'm going to end up that day, not knowing who I'm going to meet, not knowing what adventures I'm going to get into. So that's the thing I love about traveling. And hitchhiking is a way to make that unpredictability happen, if that makes sense. The second reason is that it's just a laugh. Like, it's just fun. (laughs) You you meet ridiculous people, you get into ridiculous situations, you never know what's going to happen. And more often than not, it just ends up being funny, some sort of funny adventure. And then the third reason, in terms of the actual travel of it, it's more sort of real. And I, I don't want to sound pretentious mm-hmm. when I say that, but like when you travel, when you go to a new place, you're sort of removed from the the reality of that place. So obviously, I'm never going <clears> to <throat> understand life as a local. If I go to wherever country in the world, I'm never going to understand life as a local. But for the most part, when you do go traveling, the only local people that you meet are, are people who work for like a tourist agency or people who work in a restaurant or people who work in a hotel or whatever. But if you stand on the side of the road and stick your thumb out and get picked up by some random local person, I feel like that's the best possible way to get in touch with like local life and local people and local culture. And I know that sounds really pretentious and I don't mean it to, but does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. It's just another way to do it, right? Uh, as far as yeah. being immersed into the culture for sure. So let's go back to the first couple of times you did it, right? <laughs> was it was it like super intentional or you know, was it just because you needed to get someplace? You said it wasn't, but like how did you decide like that was gonna be your mode of transportation? Uh, it, it was an intention because it wasn't about needing from get needing to get from one place to another place because for that there were buses or trains or taxis or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And I was actually thinking about this and I can't remember the exact first country that I did it, but it was either Bosnia or Serbia. And I'm not entirely sure which one of those two it was, but it was definitely one of those two because um, I went to those two places on the same trip. I, I, I'm not like a panicky man. I don't really panic or worry about many things um and these days when i hitchhike and the thousands of times i've hitchhiked since the situation i'm talking about now i don't worry about it at all but uh, the first couple of times i was a little bit nervous like 
because you hear all these horror stories, don't you, about people getting murdered by hitchhikers. <laughs> um, murdered when hitchhiking, sorry. Uh, although they do get murdered by hitchhikers as well. And you hear all these horror stories. So the first couple of times I was a bit apprehensive and a bit more cautious than I would be these days. But yeah, I wasn't I wasn't too worried or I wasn't too nervous, if that, if that answers your question. Yeah, so did you... Tell everyone that you were going to do this. I mean, like, did you did you share your intention with other people like that you knew your friends or family? You say, hey, I'm going to hitchhike from this point to this point. No, I was I was just in the middle. Uh, I just remember being in the middle of a trip and it was a thing that I'd thought about a handful of times. And I thought, well, OK, let's just do it on this trip then. So no, I didn't make any fuss about it. I just okay, stood so, on the side of a road and, and that was that. Yeah. So afterwards, when you start telling these stories, what were people's reactions to the fact that you had done this? I mean, as I say, I've done it thousands of times since. Right. And but the but the but the, the general reaction is always, oh my god, or oh, you're not scared, or oh my god, why? When you can just get a bus. They're the two main reactions, really. Yeah. Obviously answered with. I, I want to be surprised. <laughs> I want to have some, yeah. Some, I want I just like the adventure. Fun. Yeah. So walk us through actually what happens when you do this. Well, what's kind of like your process? Do you do you start in the middle of the city, or do you take off walking for a while and get someplace that's a little remote? I mean, how do you take this on? So it it it, it it's completely dependent on a lot of different factors. So I didn't realize we we're going to get into the logistics of hitchhiking yet, <laughs> but. Um, um, it, it totally depends on a few different factors. So one of the factors is how how far you're going to be going or how far you want to be going. Another factor is uh, are you in a city or are you in a town or are you in a village? Another factor is how friendly are local people? And another factor is how normal is hitchhiking in the place you're doing it? Mm. So say, for example, if... Right now I'm in Georgia, right? The country of Georgia where I live. If I am in the city, which I am right now, and I want to get somewhere else, the best course of action is to look at a map and see where I want to go and see what road that place is on. And then I want to work out. And to hitchhike out of a city is impossible. I couldn't just like stand out on my street right. now and put my hand out. Right. And someone's coincidentally going to be going where I'm going. So what I, what I would have to do instead is take a bus to or close to the road that I want to be on and find a convenient place to stand and hitchhike from there. But if I'm uh, in some small town or some small village, you know, when you get into really remote places and there's basically just one road that runs from village to village to village to village. If I'm in a place like that, you literally just stand anywhere on that main road because anyone going the same direction as you is going to be going towards the same places as you. So yeah, it depends on a few different factors, really. Some some places it's better to have a sign. Some places it's better to not have a sign. Some places you put your thumb out, like everyone does in the movies. Some places, for whatever reason, that's considered a bit offensive or something. So you just put out <laughs> a flat hand instead. Um, but broadly, it's just about looking at a map and being logical about the route. So you talk about the, this, yeah, you talk about this culture of, you know, either sticking your thumb, your thumb out, having a sign, not having a sign. <laughs> How do you figure those things out as you're, just traveling do you ask locals or do you just or you just go out there and see what works yeah i think i think it's a, a combination of those two things so definitely uh, over time i learned that i should ask local people what's more appropriate or whatever but when i first started out i would always just like use a sign and put my thumb out but then there was a few countries that i've been in where people are like ah you shouldn't put your thumb out you should use a flat hand instead or whatever um and then you just learn tricks as you go well, so what are some of those tricks Ooh, what are some of those tricks? Okay, so choose a road where there's enough space for a car to pull in and enough space for a car to see you. So, like, if you're standing on a bend, like, oh, first of all, that's dangerous because you might get hit by a car. But mm -hmm. also, if a car is coming around the bend, you've not given them enough time to see you and then make a decision about whether or not they want to pick you up and then stop to pick you up. So that's one of the considerations... Also thinking about like combos, I, like for the most part, I hitchhike alone and I have hitchhiked alone. But the easiest way to get a lift is a man and a woman together. So if you're with like, I don't know, a friend or a girlfriend or your sister, I've hitchhiked with my sister before or whatever. And um, that's the easiest. I think it's because you look more uh, approachable and more friendly. Like mm -hmm. the chances of being picked up, the chances of picking up a man who's a murderer are probably bigger than the chances of picking up a couple who were a pair of murderers if that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and smile smi smiling's a big if you 
smile and make eye contact with the drivers, they're way more likely to stop. Is there an average, like how many times you get rejected <laughs> while you're standing out there? How does it take, you know, does it take a certain amount of time before someone stops or is it just random? Again, it, de- it depends on how rural you are, I would say. So if you are on the outskirts of a city, you might literally be standing for like, this is rare, but you might literally be standing for two hours because I think there are so many cars that it's very easy for everyone to think, well, I won't pick them up because someone else will. And that's, and that's not to say that I have some, um, that's not to say that someone should pick me up. Do you know what I mean? I don't expect anyone to pick me up. That's not a sense of entitlement. But, but when you're in the middle of nowhere uh, on some rural roads, you might not see a single car for 20 minutes, but the first one you do see will pick you up often. Is there a country that you found that you've traveled in that's more accepting of this practice than others? Yeah, there are there are some countries where it's more culturally, uh, like I, I would say acceptable, but that's not even necessarily the word. More culturally recognizable. Wow, so, okay. for ex- for example, some places where I've, I've miserably failed to hitchhike, or places <laughs> like sort of Cambodia and Vietnam and uh malaysia like i've done it in those places but it's very difficult and people are just confused so someone will stop and be like what you doing i'm like oh i'm hitchhiking and they're like well why don't you just get a bus (laughs) and you know what i mean but then there are some countries i think that the most uh accepted country that i've done it in uh would it was tajikistan so like when i was in tajikistan a few years ago um it's legitimately just a form of public transport because there are so few options for public transport that, and so few people have access to their own cars that it's just a legitimate form of transport. So there's a, the whole range, people who are utterly bemused and then people who go, oh yeah, there's one of 100 hitchhikers I've seen today. Uh, tell us the, the funniest story you have from hitchhiking and tell us the scariest story you have from hitchhiking. Ooh, big questions. Um, funniest. Let me have a... I scribbled down some notes before this call um, of like some of the most interesting experiences I've had, but I hadn't thought about funniest. Um, I'll tell you what is, what is quite funny is often people will assume that I'm homeless, like legitimately <laughs> just a homeless person. And it's like, no, this is just fun. So actually, yeah. So one time I was hitchhiking around Scotland. So I'm from England. Uh, I'm from the north of England, a place called Newcastle, which is very close to Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was hitchhiking around Scotland. There's a, a famous road trip called the North Coast 500, and it's 500 miles or 800 kilometers if you you would prefer kilometers, but I know some listeners might. And I was I was hitchhiking around that, and I was at the uh, one of the northern roads, uh, and I was standing on the side of the road, and two cars full of teenagers drove <laughs> past me uh, and like beat their horn, and they were like, "Hey!" because they were 18 and. When you're 18, everything's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then, and then, and then later in the day, I was on a different part of a different part of a road in the same area, and these two cars of teenagers passed me again, and the same thing happened again. Uh, and then later in the day, again for the third time, these same two cars drove past me, and then about two minutes later, they came back again and they were like okay we've seen you three times today <laughs> we've made the sort of we've made the call together there's a consensus we're going to pick you up and we're going to take you wherever you're going and i was like okay cool um so after like being hesitant and a bit scared or whatever these these boys i was about like 27 or 28 and these kids were like 18 or 19 and they just picked me up um and as I was in their car, they thought, they said, oh, so what are you doing here? Obviously, you're homeless, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not homeless. I'm just a, a guy who likes having fun. Um, and then I ended up spending like three or four days just with these teenagers. It was like really <laughs> sort of bizarre. So they were like, oh, okay, like like just uh, stay at our house tonight. So then I stayed at like one of their houses. And then we went to some like cabin in like some mountain town that one of their parents owned. And I just spent the next few days with these like teenage boys. <laughs> but, but that was your intention, right? Though I mean, you, at some level, that is kind of what you want to happen. At some level, right? No, it, it's it's a it's a hundred percent what I want to happen, and and it's like not not necessarily just with teenage boys. Right, I get it, locals, I get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and and that's a thing that's happened like many times before. The strangeness of that for me, or the funny 
part of that for me was just how they these guys were obviously adamant that I was some like dangerous homeless man <laughs> and like in, in spite of themselves they made the decision to pick me up anyway and then how quickly that flipped from being like oh this is a mm. a dangerous man to like oh let's just be friends with this man instead you know yeah I mean you've got to be cool if um, you're out there doing that for the fun of it <laughs> you know you've, you've got to probably be a pretty cool or, or desperate maybe <laughs> yeah. I don't know desperate for an adventure <laughs> Um, and maybe but, what's the but, scariest what's kind of what's kind of the scariest thing that happens that's happened to you on it honestly not nothing like i can't point to any particular experience that's been like particularly scary but i think the only thing is like i'm from england where people drive very safely uh and in lots of other countries people don't drive very safely <laughs> um and especially especially yeah like you often get the like a lot of countries, especially Eastern European countries, for whatever reason, it's a, a big thing in Georgia once you get outside the cities um, and places like Albania and Romania have experienced this. Like people are like super, super reckless. So say you have a road and it's like one lane going one way and one lane going the other way. Um, people will just overtake on a blind curve and like all this sort of stuff and it's a bit mad. And then you're often as well in rural areas get drunk drivers and like... <laughs> I, by the time you're in, by the time you're in the car and it's a bit too late and they're driving really recklessly and they're drunk, it is a bit like, ah, uh, maybe I should have just got the train today. Yeah. And so, how do you end that ride? How do you say, okay, I'm good, you can let me out now? How's that conversation? Uh, this is this is not the best advice for anyone listening to this podcast, but I just don't. I just like, I don't know shrug it off and hope for the best which yeah. I, which is not good advice and i'm not saying anyone else should do that but i don't know i'm i just i'm not a worrier when it comes to things yeah. like that here at the crossing it off podcast we are passionate about inspiring you and in your bucket list lifestyle and empowering you to live out your list we offer many resources to assist you in your bucket list journey such as web resources in the show notes bucket list mentoring services my book live out your lists a private facebook group for you to share your bucket list success stories with others and more all of these can be found at crossing it off podcast.com Find the resource that fits your need so that you can live out your list. Now back to the show. Now that is good. That's actually good advice. If you're going to do it, I mean, you you better put yourself in a position where you'll accept whatever the universe sends to you, I think. Well, yeah, that's certainly one way to look at it. (laughs) So Paul, what is like one of your trips that you think is like your best hitchhiking experience? Okay. So I've done a few different trips. Some of them have been sort of aimless. Some of them have been actual road trips. But the one that sticks in my mind as an indication of why I hitchhike and how friendly and hospitable and generous people can be is my trip to Azerbaijan. So years ago, I spent 10 days, I think it was 10 days in Azerbaijan. And my memory is a little bit foggy, but I spent in the whole entire 10 days, I spent around 50 or 55 dollars, US dollars. I know it's crazy and I, I didn't go with the intent like it's not like I just had $55 in my bank account and I was like living on a budget and I was like oh my god I can't spend any more money it was just that was how kind people were so like I'll give you a couple of examples from that well broadly from that trip people would pick me up and all I was expecting I wasn't even expecting all I was hoping for was a lift right mm-hmm. and I would say hey do you want some money every time every time they would say no but they wouldn't just give me a lift they would take me to their home they would give me dinner they would let me sleep there and then the next day they would give me a breakfast and then drive me back to the main road that I wanted to be on so that I could go about my day right so this happened over and over and over again in my 10 days in Azerbaijan but there are two specific examples that really really stuck with me the first one was uh, someone was giving me a ride and I got to where I was going and they dropped me off at the side of the road and there was a, a big truck selling watermelons and there was two guys drinking tea and selling watermelons and they said hello And obviously, I don't look like a man from Azerbaijan, and I don't speak the local language, so they could see that I was a foreigner. So they give me they give me some tea, give me some watermelon, and that that was about all. But then suddenly, one of the guys came over with his telephone, and it was his brother on the other end of the telephone, and he did speak English. And he said, "Oh, my brother's just uh, told me that you're drinking some tea with him, and you have, and you you know you're like in a new country, and blah blah blah. We'd like to invite you to our home tonight." And it was like. Oh, wow, okay, just this guy selling watermelons, like him and his brother, I'm going to go and stay at their home. So I did, and it was lovely. And I'm still, uh, not so much now, but for many years, I was still in touch with the guy who spoke English and very sporadically me and him sent each other messages. The second one, 
the second example from that trip that sticks in my brain is I was on the outskirts of Baku, which is the capital of Azerbaijan. And uh, as we've talked about, it's often harder to hitchhike out of cities because there are so many cars. Uh, but I was hitchhiking out of the capital and I, to be honest, I don't remember where I was going. Uh, I could look at a map and find out, but that would take way too much time. Um, <laughs> you don't want to sit watching me do that, do you? But anyway, um, so I was standing on the side of the road and a, a, a taxi came past and he said, do you want to ride? And uh, I said, oh, no, I'm, not look I'm going quite far. I'm not looking for a taxi, blah, blah, blah. I could just take the bus. Do you know what I mean? If I'm going to use public transport, I can just take the bus. It's OK. And then about 10 minutes later, the same taxi came back again. And he said, OK, I'll take you. And I said, but I don't like I, I, I don't have enough money for a taxi. It's fine. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, so anyway, he did drive me there. And I, I did have enough money for a taxi, but I just didn't want to pay a taxi fare. You know, right, it, was sure. like a three hour, it was a three hour journey or something. I thought if I'm going to go three hours, I'd rather just pay for a bus, you know. So he, this guy drove me all the way all the way to where I was going, which was like, yeah, two or three hour journey. Then we got there and I said, okay. And I tried to give him some money and he wouldn't take my money. And I was like, boy, this guy's just driven all this way. And he's a taxi driver and he doesn't want my money. So I thought, okay, maybe then he just lives in the place where I've just gone to. And for him, it was just, he's going there anyway. I might as well mm -hmm. take this guy. And, uh, and uh, he spoke a little bit of English and I said, oh, so do you live here? You must live the place you've dropped me. He said, no, I live in Baku. The place that we just driven from, right? <laughs> this guy was taking like a four, five, six hour round trip just because he was a nice man. Yeah. So at this point, like I insisted on giving him some money and he took a little bit of money. And then I was like, oh, let me give you some food, some drinks, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know, man. Like he, he didn't do it for money. He just did it because he was a nice man. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's amazing. And I, yeah. So I feel like this behavior is not exclusive to Azerbaijan, but I feel like my trip to Azerbaijan is probably the best there. Uh, the best summary of, of why I like to hitchhike and all that sort of stuff, you know. If you were sitting in a cafe with somebody and they said, oh, I, yeah, I, I would hitchhike or I'm, I'm trying to get to this place. I'm thinking about hitchhiking. What advice would you give them you, if they were doing it? And you would say, OK, well, if you're going to do that, you have to do X. What's the X? Hmm. This is an interesting question, isn't it? Um, the first thing I would say is to plan your route wisely. Um. So like Jen, old school, isn't it? But look at a map. It doesn't have to be a paper map. You can go on Google Maps. Look at a map and think about where you want to be, obviously, where you're leaving from. Also, obviously, in the quickest route that connects those places um, and just get nice and early onto that road. But also you want to get, it's quite hard to describe what I mean. So say you've got a road, right? Let's call mm -hmm. it the A1, A1 road. That's, that's a road from close to where I was born. The A1 road, okay. But before you get to the A1 road, you're going to have a lots, lots of little mini roads that are going to all lead onto that road. Standing on or around these mini roads is no help because people driving on these mini roads could be going anywhere. So right. you want to get on the road, the road that directly goes in the direction that you're going to, because only then is anybody going to stop for you. And only then is there a good chance that people are going to be going to the same place as you. I would say if you go on, uh, on a long journey, carry a sign with the name of wherever you're going, but only on a long journey. Another thing I would say is smile, be smiley, look friendly, look happy. Don't hitchhike at night because first of all, it's like not safe, but also because if people can't see you, they're not going to pick you up. Yeah. You get hit. That's, that's why it's not safe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right, and and I think there is all also like people can, are less likely to actually see you because it's dark. Um, but I think there's also something in like, and this is coming from a man who does regularly hitchhike. If if I was driving along and I saw someone like hitchhiking, I would happily pick them up. If I saw them like in a dimly lit street, I'd be like, mm, is that a good idea to pick them up? You know, you know. Yeah. Another tip: start early, uh, because you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes you have to wait for a long time. Sometimes you get picked up by someone, but they're only going 30 minutes down the road and you want to get four hours down the road. Wear bright clothes so people can see you. Also, like a tip I would give is like when I first started doing it, it, it wasn't a budgetary thing, but I did have a lot less money than I do now. Not that I've got loads of money now, but, you know, I was a, a, a poor early 20s man. Sometimes I would offer money. Sometimes I wouldn't offer money. Um but now I always, always, always do it. I, for many years now, I've always offered mm. money. And it's maybe 5% of the, pi the, the time people take that money at most. Um, but I would say always offer money as well. Yeah, no, for sure. <clears throat> I think that, you know, they're offering you a service and, and that's a, a good thing to be kind. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing, right? That's the thing. Uh, one, one thing I would say, actually, uh, is often women will say to me, uh, like as a man, my perspective is 
well, my, my male perspective is different to a female perspective, right? And that's absolutely true. So like to any men out there, I will absolutely say, hitchhike, don't worry about it. Don't worry about safety. 99% sure that you're going to be okay. Obviously, I understand that that's different for women. And that is obviously not the fault of women. It's the fault of any potential horrible people who might pick them up. What I, what I would say is that I have met solo women who've hitchhiked. And I've never met any solo women who've hitchhiked who've had any problems. But that's not to say that any woman who would hitchhike solo would get into problems. I personally have hitchhiked with a lot of different women, some friends, some ex-girlfriends. As I say, I've hitchhiked with my sister. I've hitchhiked with like random women I've met on trips uh, in different places. So I guess for like women, it's, it would be safe to hitchhike with another man. But um, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say overall there is like I'm very aware that it's potentially a lot more dangerous for women to hitchhike. Paul, tell us, looking back at your experiences, what's something that you've gained personally or had some transformation in you and how you look at the world or how you look at travel through hitchhiking? I, I think naturally I'm quite a trusting person anyway. Uh, and naturally I like to believe the best of people uh, or see the best in people. But I would say that hitchhiking has amplified that by like, I don't know, 20 times, 50 times, 100 times, whatever. It's so incredible to me. Even when I do it now, I'm still surprised by the generosity and the hospitality and the kindness of just strangers. Like, so the number of times that I've stood on a road and then someone's pulled in and I've never met this person before, but that person obviously has given me a ride, right? Because that's why they stopped. But, and, and that is way more than I could ever expect. But beyond that, people do other things. Like they'll take you to their favorite restaurant and they'll pay for you. They'll take you to their house and they'll give you a place to stay. They'll feed you while you're at their house. They'll, I don't know, if you're driving past a famous viewpoint or a famous tourist attraction, they'll just take you there. And the number of times that's happened is crazy. It's so crazy to me. And it's just made me realize that not everyone, like, of course, there are some people in the world to do bad things. But I think for the most part, everyone's just trying their best, you know, and everyone is a nice, hospitable, given, caring, understanding person. And hitchhiking has allowed me to see that and experience that. But then when I, when I tell people this, like a lot of my friends and family and, you know, people I meet or whatever, they sort of don't believe it. And they're like, no, oh, yeah, whatever. I've never experienced <laughs> that. So I, I don't I don't think it's true. And And I understand that people don't think it's true. But I think what I always say about hitchhiking is, is to experience the, the warmth and the generosity and the kindness and the hospitality of people. It's not just going to come to you magically. You have to put yourself in a slightly precarious situation where you're able to receive that kindness and generosity and hospitality and warmth and blah, blah, blah. And unless you put yourself in the position, it's not going to come to you because how could it? So, yeah, I just think it's made me, a, it's made me have more faith in humanity not that I had a li- not that I had little faith in humanity anyway. I think I've always had quite a decent amount of faith in humanity. Yeah, I think if someone's willing to stop, uh, there's probably yeah. some sense of seeing you're being vulnerable, and if you're being vulnerable, then they can be vulnerable. <laughs> and I think that that's you know part of being human uh, when, when kindness happens. So it's interesting you say that, right? Because I find that sometimes people pick it, like sometimes people pick you up and you'll have quite superficial interactions, um, understandably, but sometimes people pick you up and you'll have like the most sort of profound, interesting, heart to heart conversations Mm. that you maybe, maybe would even struggle to have with your closest friends or your family members or whatever, because there's something about the, the transience of the experience where it's like, I don't know you, you don't know me. We're going to be contained in this space together for one hour and never see each other again, never contact each other again. So let's just like sh- share the way we feel with each other. And there is vulnerability. And people have told me some like crazy things when I've been in cars with them. And I think like, wow, wow like you're sharing this with me. And I would struggle to share that feeling that you've shared with me. I'd struggle to share that with some of my closest people, you know, but there's something about that shared vulnerability that you've put into better words than me, even though I've just spent five minutes talking about it there. <laughs> yeah. no, just, just recap what you said. Uh, so, <clears throat> Paul, tell us, what's something else on your bucket list that you want to cross off or do? So these days, uh, I'm a, a bit more of a boring man. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 do, I do have things on... So I, I have, like, a bucket list of things I want to achieve in my life, but also what I tend to do most years as well... Um, uh, at the beginning of every year, I'll write a list of goals that I have mm-hmm. for that year. So I don't have anything so exciting on uh, on the list right now. But one of my things 
uh, was to move on my list was to move back to Georgia, the country of Georgia. Um, and I've already done that. I'm speaking to you right now from Georgia. So that's on the list. Um, I also have some like fitness goals and some lifestyle goals and stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, but another one I decided last at the, the back end of last year to sort of like cut down on drinking. Not that I've ever had a problem with drinking, but I just hate hangovers now. I can't mentally yeah. handle them. And I, <laughs> this is and like re- recently uh, I was like, you know what? This is the time when I'm going to not stop drinking, but stop getting drunk. So maybe have, you know, three, four beers a month. And that's all. So. The, yeah, the, the the big thing I'm tackling right now is less drinking, uh, and the most recent thing I've tackled that was on the list is to come and live in Georgia again. Yeah, you know, for me, a bucket list is all about what brings you joy. So it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it brings you joy, that's all that matters. And I can tell you that as you know, I'm still probably twice your age, so uh, <laughs> you're getting there. So. How, how old are you? Yeah, we're not talking about that. Uh, <laughs> so, so, but I can tell you. It gets worse. Being drunk and having hangovers gets worse as you get older. So, so it's probably a good thing to start now. (laughs) It's brutal, man. It's just like I don't know. Like, say I'll have like five beers, and then for the next week, I'll be like so, so, so anxious, and it's like like, I just can't handle it, man. So it's just, it's just not worth it. Although I miss it in lots of ways, it's just not worth it anymore. Yep, it happens as you get older. Paul, tell us where folks can find you online. And, and get engaged with some of your other storytelling. Okay, so uh, I am a travel writer. That's my job. I'm a, a digital nomad and a travel writer. And I work for a, a website called travelness.com, travelness.com. So that's the word travel followed by N-E-S-S.com. And it's a, it's a travel website, obviously. And it's the what we go by is travel guides you can trust. So we only write about places that we know well, me and the team. We only write about places where either we've lived or we've traveled for at least one month. Um, so you can find a lot of my writing there. I do For them, I do a lot of writing about Georgia, about Scotland, about England. So if you just type Travelness Scotland into Google and then click on the first couple of links, you'll be able to get examples of our articles. Or if you just want to find me for me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn as as Paul McDougall. But I'm assuming because you listen to this, you're more interested in travel. So Travelness is the place to find my travel writing. Awesome. Uh, I will put those in the show notes so that people can click away and find you. Paul, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I wish you luck on uh, drinking less in the coming years. (laughs) Thanks very much.